According to the National Institute of Mental Health here in America, anxiety disorders, panic attack, overstress, burnout, those type of things, anxiety disorders affect roughly 40 million Americans between the ages of 18 and 54. And these are not stats like from 20 years ago, these are like April 2016. 40 million Americans. We have more food than we can eat. Most of us have homes to live in and jobs. We're not at war with each other yet, hopefully. We live in relative security. We can go where we want, marry who we want, eat what we want, live where we want, work where we want. No imminent threat. And yet 40 million Americans struggle with anxiety disorders. I suppose we could use words like stress, worry, as well as anxious when we talk about the struggle that affects so many of us from time to time and to a greater or lesser degree. It's not just people from 18 to 54, people younger than that and people older than that you know, uh, struggle with these type of things, but that's kind of the, the stat that I'm working with. In the world, there are a lot of remedies offered to counter the problems of stress and anxiety and worry. Obviously, there's medication, you know, vacations, therapy, support groups, all kinds of things. Breathing exercises, yoga. As Christians, however, we believe that even if these methods might be helpful, and many of them are, the most satisfying and permanent solution to the problems of worry and stress can only be found through faith, and specifically through faith in Christ. And so with this in mind, I'd like to review the story of Elijah and how God helped him deal with his extreme case of stress and worry and eventual burnout. And that's where we go for our lesson, 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's begin reading verse one to three. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he, meaning Elijah, and he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Now I don't have time to read the entire story, so I'm picking it up right here and maybe just paraphrase, give you a little bit of background. Elijah, the prophet, lived in the ninth century before Christ. He was a prophet who served God during the reign of several kings, not just one king, but many kings. But one especially bad king, and his name was Ahab, and his wife's name was Jezebel. Now much of Elijah's ministry involved the conflict between himself and the royal couple over the introduction of pagan worship to Israel. Jezebel was from Tyre, and through her influence, the worship of Baal, Melquart, who was the official nature god of Tyre, was being actively brought into the kingdom. Now the word Baal, or Baal, as it's pronounced, means master, or possessor, or husband. In pagan religions of the time, every piece of land had its master. And so each place or each town had its version of a master or a Baal uh, deity. So that's why you have Baal, the name of one city, Baal, the name of another city. Every city, every town, every plot of land had this God. So in response to this, Elijah had prayed for a drought to come over the land and it did not rain for three years. And the point behind this is that since Baal was a deity that was supposed to control nature, 
this drought was a demonstration of this pagan religion's emptiness and lack of any power. So Elijah, towards the royal couple and towards the country was saying, you people are starting to follow this God. This is the God that's in charge of nature. Let me show you who's in charge of nature. And so he prayed to Jehovah, the God of the Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and prayed and said, no rain. And no rain came for three long years. Of course, the drought also made the king and queen greater enemies of Elijah. After three years, Elijah challenged all the prophets of Baal to meet him at Mount Carmel in order to demonstrate who was greater, Jehovah or Baal. After this meeting, Elijah taunted and ridiculed them and performed a great miracle before the assembled people to show that, God, that the God he served was the true God and Baal worship was futile. After this great demonstration of power, Elijah then ordered that the 450 priests of Baal be killed and they were put to death by the people. Now the point here was that all of these priests had been appointed by Jezebel and were supported financially by Jezebel in her attempt to bring this religion into Israel. Now if this were not enough, he also offered another prayer asking God to send rain. And so after three years, the heavens opened up and the water poured forth. After doing these things, realizing that he may be in danger, he escaped on foot to another town. And that's where we picked up the reading where she threatens him and she says, I swear to you before the day is over, you're going to be as dead as those priests over there, so he takes off running. And so I, I, I give you this story to underscore the idea that Elijah experienced a physical and emotional and spiritual roller coaster for three years, culminating in the great showdown at Mount Carmel. He is only a man, and if we read be between the lines, we realize that this man is close to burnout extremely anxious, extremely stressed, ready to completely fall apart. Now, Elijah experienced things that were beyond what normal life requires of ordinary people, and that's what was causing his, I mean, you know, I, we don't have time to get into all of it, but I mean, a certain amount of stress is good. You need a certain amount of stress to get you up and going, but too much stress, when the needle is in the red all the time, too much stress, that leads to burnout. And too much stress sometimes is when, uh, happens when too many things are happening at the same time. And so in Elijah's life, if you look over the three years, you see, first of all, miracles were done in his name. And you think, well, that's a, that's a good thing. But having a miracle done in your name as you call out to God is a very you know, exciting and stressful thing. There was a war going on that he experienced. A natural disaster, yeah, he prayed that there'd be no rain. Well, there was no rain for three years. That brought a drought upon the country, terrible economic loss, and he was the cause of it, that the people were, were blaming him. Threats of death, forced travel, he had to run away, he had to hide. Have you ever had to run away and hide for your life? I mean, think about that for a second. Imagine, people are looking for you, they want to kill you. That's a pretty stressful thing. And then of course the rejection by society. He's trying to serve God, he's trying to do something, but everybody, both sides hate him. The king and queen hate him, the people hate him. So people, you know, they can manage some of these things, but when too many good things or too many bad things happen too rapidly, we blow a fuse, we burn out. As a protection, our body is protecting us from total destruction. It's as if our body is saying, well, maybe you want to keep going at this pace, but I'm going to cause an electrical short circuit here just to stop everything so that we don't completely ruin ourselves. So that's what was going on with, with Elijah. Now, burnout has symptoms, and we can recognize these burnout symptoms as we look at Elijah and the dialogue that he has with the Lord. So we go back to chapter 19 and we pick it up in verse 4. The first 
symptom, if you wish, or one of the major symptoms of burnout is despair. In verse four he says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life. And so even though he had witnessed a great victory, he had done great miracles, he was in despair. And the, the chief's, you know, the signifying feeling about despair is there's no hope. You have no hope. He had no hope, not because there was nothing to believe in, not because there was no proof to support his faith. He had no hope because he couldn't function properly to see these things anymore. Another evidence of burnout is self depreciation. You know, I'm no good, nobody loves me. Look at verse four, continue in verse four, right to the end. You know, he says, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my fathers. Self depreciation, I'm no good, nobody loves me. Why should I try? You know, burned out people are hard on themselves. No matter what they've done, it's never good enough. Burnout makes you feel like a failure and nothing can convince you otherwise. Even if your wife or your husband or your friends tell you, well, no, but look at all the good things that you've done and you've accomplished this and people love you. It, you just cannot be convinced that there's anything good about your life or your person. You know, those, those voices inside your head that tell you, uh, that encourage you or discourage you usually are the loudest uh, during the times that uh, you feel overstressed and overworried. Uh, uh, one of the symptoms is when that voice is constantly negative in your mind, constantly telling you that you're not good, that you are not going to make it, you're not worthy, uh, then something else is taking place there. Another uh, symptom, uh, anger and resentment. Like I said, it's a long story, so let's just skip down to verse 10 in this dialogue that he's having with God, chapter 19, he says, Then Elijah came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Do you see the resentment there? Elijah felt angry about, he felt angry about how he felt. <laughs> you know, if you do your best, if you try your hardest, if you succeed, what should happen? Well, you should feel good, not bad. When the only reward we get from all of our efforts is fatigue and depression, we need to step back a little bit because we're, we're close to burnout. He's here. I mean, the greatest victory, single-handedly defeated all these priests, stopped the invasion of this, this false religion into, 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 the, into the country. And how does he feel? He says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the only one left. I've tried the best and look, look what's happened to me. I, in other words, he's saying to God, I did what you wanted me to do and look where I am now. What's the point of serving you? What did I get for all of my effort? Anger, resentment. And then of course, loneliness. Verse 14, skip down to verse 14. He says, then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. Repeats this, he repeats it from before. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Does that sound familiar? Well, he just said that a little while before. The Lord is talking to him. Why are you here, Elijah? What's the problem, Elijah? He says, well, you know, I did what you said and look where I am and I'm all by myself and I'm the only one that's fighting. And the Lord talks to him some more, talks to him some more. And what does Elijah do? He repeats the same thing. He's in shock. You ever notice people in shock? 
what happens to them many times if they're at least awake? They kind of start repeating the story. Well, I was just standing there and I went to cross the street and this car just came out of nowhere and just brushed me back and I bounced against the wall and I hurt my head and my arm is sore. You know? And three minutes later, four minutes later, someone else says, you okay? Yeah, well, I just stepped out. You know, it's like a broken record. They keep repeating the thing. They're trying to absorb it. He's trying to absorb it. He can't quite absorb everything. Why? Because he's saturated with stress and anger and resentment and here loneliness. He repeats his complaint and with it his greatest worry that he be left alone. You know, burnout makes people feel that no one really understands them. No one really cares. No one knows how we feel or why we feel the way we do. It's a terribly lonely thing. You know, Elijah lived nearly 3,000 years ago, yet his symptoms and feelings are so very familiar to us who struggle today in 2017 with depression and low self-esteem and resentment and, 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 and alienation in our modern pressure cooker society because people have not changed. We're the same as we have always been. Now, there are some common mistakes that people do when they suffer from too much stress or they're on the verge of burnout. You know, aside from the physical feelings of fatigue and the emotional problems associated with burnout, this condition also pushes us to make mistakes that we would not normally do if we were emotionally you know, balanced and rested properly. Mistake number one, for example, we focus on feelings rather than facts. We focus on feelings rather than facts. Elijah prayed that he might die. He looked inward and he saw the world through the lens of his feelings, not through the facts of what had actually happened. I feel like a failure, therefore, I am a failure. This is called emotional reasoning and it's a mistake. I feel lost even though I've confessed Christ and I've been baptized and I'm doing the best I can to be faithful, but I feel guilty. I feel that I'm, I'm not worthy. Therefore, I, all, all of what he said must not be true because it doesn't match how I feel. Well, brothers and sisters, we're not saved based on what we feel, we're saved on based on what we believe and what we do. You know, people who are overstressed or burned out are easily drawn into um, focusing and interpreting our life through our feelings rather than our facts. Mistake number two, we begin comparing ourselves to other people. Elijah cried that he was no better than who? Than his forefathers. We usually compare our weaknesses to other people's strengths and we always come out losing. You ever notice that? <laughs> you, know, you know, I like to play golf. Who do I compare myself to? Well, I compare myself to a guy who you know, plays 20 strokes better than I do every time. Or well, you look at the pros on TV and you see uh, you know, one of the pros you know, makes this fantastic shot, makes it look easy, two feet in front of the pin. And then when you try it and it doesn't work, you, oh man, what's the matter with me? I'm so, what's the matter with me? I'm going to give up this game. Well, who are you comparing yourself to? Well, the world champion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mistake number three, stressed out people, motivate themselves with negatives instead of positives. Elijah complained that he had been zealous for God, but the people had rejected God and his preaching in verse 10. Do you see it? We blame self, we punish ourselves with criticism and we label ourselves with harsh judgments. It's no wonder we feel bad. We become our worst critics. You think, you know, I, you know I, I always pray, God, help me not to be too critical, to be more gracious with other people. You think I can be critical of you? <laughs> uh, you ain't seen nothing till I start being critical with myself. Why? Because I know me. 
I know who I am. I know how hard I really tried. You know what I'm saying? So when I level criticism at me, whoa, it's got a very pointy edge. You can't motivate yourself by criticizing yourself. I'm not saying we should excuse or just let everything go by that we do wrong. No, of course not. We need to hold ourselves accountable. But we cannot motivate ourselves to higher and better and more noble and more spiritual by continually criticizing ourselves. Doesn't work. Mistake number four, we exaggerate the negatives. Elijah said, I am the only one left. Now later on, uh, the Lord tells him, yeah, you and 7,000 others. <laughs> the attitude, or this attitude, degenerates into self-pity and to despair. So here's what the cycle looks like, okay? This, this, this over-stress, over-anxious cycle. It begins, we're overburdened. We're overstimulated. We're overworked. We're overstressed. We're overworried. You know, too much, too fast. And it doesn't have to be bad things. It can be good things. We just got too much, too many plates spinning in the air. This leads to a weakened physical and mental resistance as well as a spiritual letdown. You just don't have enough gas in the tank to take care of all the things that you've been committed to or to take care of all the things that may have happened to you then this condition produces a variety of symptoms such as anger and depression and low self-esteem and moodiness and all kinds of things. And then these attitudes drive us to make critical mistakes such as emotional reasoning and false comparisons and negative self-judgments and further alienation from other people. And then these mistakes produce what? Well, they produce more stress more stress on our system, which perpetuates the vicious cycle leading to total breakdown. And what I'm saying is that sometimes the body, again, you know, not claiming any medical knowledge, but I've seen it in myself, the overstress, eventually the body takes over and says, okay, buddy, you know, you're about to kill yourself, so we're going to do something here. We're going to give you a lot of low back pain, or we're going to give you some migraines, or you're going to have an upset stomach, or you're going to, you know, we're going to do something to just knock you out. Break the cycle. Because if you keep on spinning, you're going, to push, you're going to blow up. So God, thankfully, has a remedy for burnout. Prescription for burnout. Because He is aware of the body's frailty, especially when it is under stress. So in this same pas uh, passage, we see the remedy that God uses to renew a burned out servant named Elijah. So the first thing that God prescribes is a rest. A rest. God gave Elijah rest for his body. In verse five, go back to verse five, because I've had to jump around in the, in the uh, passage here, he says, uh, Elijah lay down and slept under a juniper tree and behold there was an angel touching him and he said to him arise eat. Then he looked and behold there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said arise eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So the body you know, will, all, will short circuit if it does not receive rest and nourishment. A balance of work and rest and leisure is the best medicine for a burned out system. You know, people usually rest until they are well enough to repeat the same mistakes that led to the burnout originally. <laughs> 
they're working 64 hours, 70 hours a week, and then they've got this over here, and then they're taking care of a sick uh, aunt and, the, and the, the church things that they've got to do, and then they've committed themselves to something else, you know, and all of a sudden, boom, they burn out and they're, they're, you know, they can't do it, so they, oh, I need a rest, you know, and then they, they take a break, a vacation, something, just to, to recharge the batteries. And what do they do when that rest is over? Well, they go back to doing the same things over again, no changes. They don't realize that if they repeat the same type of things, they're going to end up in the same place. People usually, as I say, rest until they're well enough to repeat the same old mistakes. What's needed is an attitude that understands that rest and leisure are as important as work in developing a balanced and pleasing life to God. And many of us, unfortunately, feel guilty when we're having fun. We feel guilty when we're having fun, as if, oh, it's a guilt, my guilty pleasure is uh, I go fishing. You know. Why should you feel guilty about that? You know, I was thinking the other day, uh, I was giving thanks. You know, sometimes in my own prayers, you know, I say, today I'm just going to give thanks. I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm not going to complain about anything. I'm just going to find the things in my life and just say thank you for them. And I realized as I was making that prayer that almost, I mean, I couldn't think of an exception, but there may be one out there. Almost everything that God has created is for our pleasure. <laughs> I look at the sky, the beautiful sky, even with the cloud formation, it gives me pleasure. Pleasure for my eyes. Look at, the, oh, it's just amazing. And I smell, the grass gets cut. And I smell the grass. And what does it do? You know, freshly mown grass, right? We know. It gives me what? It gives me pleasure. I lay my head down on my pillow at night. And you know that first few moments when you, before you go to sleep, oh, oh boy, that feels so good. Pleasure. I drink a cold glass of water. Pleasure. I feel the hot sun on my head in the afternoon. Pleasure. I mean, he didn't have to create us where almost every single experience that we have ha involves pleasure of some kind. What kind of God do we have? We have a God that gives us pleasure. Not illicit pleasure, not sinful pleasure. We don't have to do things that are illicit or disobedient in order to have pleasure because he's created everything in this world to give us some kind of pleasure. We have, to, we have to understand that life has work in it, of course, and even that can be pleasurable, but it also needs rest and it also needs leisure in order to be proper, to be balanced. If you're overstressed and close to burnout, something is wrong. Something is wrong. You have to figure out what the wrong thing is. And something has to change in order to find again the balance. And that's not, I'm not throwing this at you as an accusation. I'm saying this is what you need to be thinking about if, if that's your situation over stress and anxiety and burnout. Something will have to change. It might be there needs to be more leisure. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> or maybe there needs to be less commitments. Or maybe there needs, to be, uh, there needs to be new commitments in different areas. I don't know, but something has to change. Number two in his prescription. So we said rest. The next one is release. God allowed Elijah to pour out his heart, his frustrations, his fear, and his anger before him. Again, I'll read one more time, verse nine. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I mean, do you think God didn't know what he was doing here? What was he doing? 
He was giving Elijah a chance to express himself, and he did. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's just, it's just pouring out of him. Notice there's no, notice there's no, dear Lord, I humbly come before you, my God of hosts, and I appeal to you as your humble servant, Lord. There's none of that. It's just, Elijah, what are you doing here? Oh, well, they hurt me and then I hurt them. You know, I mean. <laughs> the problem with burnout is that it's like a, a low burning fire inside that never gets extinguished. It keeps burning and building and destroying us from the inside. You can pray and cry and share with others and empty your heart before God, so the emotional energy created by the stress needs to be released. And released in a positive way, not a negative way. Some people, they get released, all right, but how do they do it? Well, they abuse drugs or alcohol or other things like that, or they do other self-harming things, thinking that this will you know, hey, I drive my car at 120 miles an hour, you know, I get some relief, or I go bungee jumping off a bridge, you know, yeah, that feels better. <laughs> there are better and safer ways and more constructive ways to release the raw emotional energy created by overstress. Third part of his prescription, rest, release, Refocusing, refocusing. Elijah was seeing only the problem, but in the cave at Horeb, he sought again the version and the vision of God that had originally sent him to prophesy. He heard again the voice of the Lord, this time verse 11. So he said, Go for, God is saying, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, sometimes it isn't a change of place or a change of people that we need. Sometimes it's a resetting of our sights on God and His word and His Son, Jesus Christ, and His church that is truly needed. In other words, sometimes we need to reestablish our spiritual priorities. Because many times the overstress and the anxieties are caused because we have you know, confused our priorities. We, 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 we've taken you know, God who should be up there and we've put them down here. Or we've taken our spouse, for example, which should be our main priority, and we've put them down here because, well, I got a lot of work to do and my career is demanding this and I, got, you know, I, I, play, uh, I play whatever, you know, I, I, play, I go play soccer on Thursday and Friday, you know, but for, for some reason or other, I've taken uh, you know, my spouse who should be my priority and I've put her down in spot number four and I don't realize that spot number four, her being in spot number four is causing a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety in my marriage and in my personal life and in her life and in the life of the children. So sometimes we need to you know, refocus, reorder. So rest, release, refocus. Recommitment, recommitment. As far as Elijah was concerned, one task was over. It had been a challenge, it had been a burden. And after a time of rest and prayer and renewal, Elijah is given a new ministry, a different service to perform for the Lord. This time we go to verse 15. The Lord said to him, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king of Aram, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi. 
you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, um, Abel Aloha, no, excuse me, Abel Hola, rather, Aloha is another country, Abel Hola, <laughs> you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So God gives him another task. Hey, there's work to be done. You need to go, you know, you need to go anoint a new king. You need to find another assistant, a new prophet. Many times the best way to beat burnout is to be active in different ways with different people pursuing different goals. Not always, but sometimes. If our focus is on God and His purpose, He will be able to direct us into some service that will give us fresh hope and a renewed sense of purpose and enthusiasm. He will also supply us with help to do the work at hand. He noticed that Elijah, this guy was burnt out, he was toast, you know, he had given his all, he wasn't the same man as he was before. So what does he do? He gives him a younger man to work with him, to help him, to mentor, to carry on the work. You know, sometimes part of the stress is, who's going to continue the good stuff that I've been doing? Who's going to take care of my family? Who's going to take care of my ministry or my job or the business that I've built up? You know, I've, I've spent so much time working on this and now I'm, I'm getting tired and I'm getting old. Who's going to take over? Who, who, who's going to bring it to fruition? Who will love it enough that they won't let it die? That they'll continue it with the same zeal that, that I had? These are real worries that people have. So Elijah was human like all of us here, who nearly burned out because of the pressures of his service to the Lord, but God renewed him with rest for his body, release for his soul, the refocusing for his spirit, and a recommitment for his heart. Also, a reinforcement for his ministry, and that would be Elisha. God not only cares for us, He knows exactly what we need for what ails us, no matter what the generation is that we live in. So the question begs, are you over anxious, stressed, burned out? Do you recognize yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're older or younger, whether you're married or single, do you recognize yourself in Elijah? Is there a little bit of Elijah in you? Are his symptoms your symptoms? Have you given up on man's solutions to fix the problems, worldly ways to be renewed? Denial or escapism or materialism or medication or hedonism, all the isms? I encourage you to try God's prescription for burnout. Just a reminder. Number one, find the proper balance between work and rest, even if it means less money. It's not all about money, brothers and sisters. Number two, express your feelings to God honestly in prayer and do it often and do it sincerely. Number three, reestablish your priorities, putting Christ and His kingdom first in your life once again. This will then properly order all of your other priorities. And number four, begin seeking for new ways to serve the Lord through His church, to serve your family, to serve your career. Sometimes working at different things with different people helps us in our renewal process. And so if this prescription means that you need to be baptized, for example, or you need to be restored through prayer, then of course we wait for you to come forward as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation.